Hi, everyone, this is the Encyclopedia Channel. In this episode, we interpret history of European civilization for you. Seeing the title of this book, do you think that this is a cultural guide introducing the historical stories and customs of European countries? However, if you go deep into this book, you will find that this book is actually going back to the origin of European civilization, exploring the origin of modern European civilization, and rearranging the relationship between European civilization tradition and modern Europe. The relationship between tradition and modernity is very important, and it is an issue that a country cannot avoid as long as it develops forward. If moving forward, how should the relationship with the past be handled? Are traditional and old things inferior to new ones, are they all dross? Is it bound to be eliminated by the times? If not eliminated, should we accept it in its entirety, or achieve some kind of reconciliation? How to deal with the relationship between tradition and modernity is an ultimate question that every country and every era must answer. After watching this film, I believe everyone will have a more rational understanding. The author of this book, Guizot, was born in 1787, just before the outbreak of the French Revolution. He died in 1874, when the French Third Republic had been established. When he was alive, he was not only a famous scholar admired by Goethe, but also once served as prime minister in the July dynasty. Two years after Guizot's birth, the French Revolution broke out. All his life, he has experienced the long and huge impact of this major historical event. Before the Great Revolution, the European continent generally practiced a monarchy, and the entire social hierarchy was strict, and the people at the bottom were very poor. Although the Great Revolution had a very good starting point, it also caused many unnecessary killings and deaths, and the whole society was in a very intense state. In a state of struggle. If France, which was relatively stable but unfair before the Great Revolution, represents the past, and France after the Great Revolution, which advocates freedom and democracy but is full of struggle and turmoil, represents the future, then how should we choose between the two? From a larger historical perspective, people should ask themselves at any important historical node how to find the balance between history and development. Guizot is standing at the node of his era, trying to find the future path of his own country, that is, France. He wants to find the balance between tradition and development, history and modernity, individual and society. However, you may ask, Guizot lived nearly 300 years away from us, and the problems he faced at that time were very different from what we are facing today, so why do we still need to read this old book? Predecessors have thought about your question, and not only have they thought about it, but they have also done it in a down-to-earth manner. After the book was published in 1828, not many people paid attention to it for more than 100 years. However, from 1985 until the end of the 20th century, French intellectual circles suddenly started a rediscovering Guizot movement with considerable momentum. This ideological movement is related to a large-scale social event similar to a revolution, that is, the 1968 march. The main appeal of this parade is dissatisfaction with France's economic recession and cultural decay after the war, and demands that all unreasonable and old ruling orders be smashed and a brand new society of their era be established. Under such circumstances, the question of how to deal with the relationship between tradition and modernity is once again facing the whole of France. In 1985, a professor named Rosanne Vallon, the oldest academic institution in France, the French Academy, gave a deafening answer to this question. His answers are collected in a book called The Moment of Guizot. He believes that Guizot has already answered the question about tradition and modernity. Modern society has always evolved from history. Traditions should not be smashed blindly. A good society should be one in which old and new things are reconciled, and pluralism coexists. The coexistence of diversity is actually the most core driving force and tradition for the continuous development of European civilization. The restlessness and turmoil in modern Europe is precisely because Europeans have gradually forgotten this great tradition in the process of making achievements. This is where rediscovering Guizot comes in. The rediscovery of Guizot really gave a tranquilizer to the restless French society. From then on, no matter when, as long as the relationship between tradition and modernity is dealt with, Guizot and this history of European civilization must be unavoidable topics. Next, we will lead you to understand this book through three questions. First, 
Why should we re-understand the relationship between tradition and modernity in the context of the entire European history? Second, how to re-understand the relationship between tradition and modernity? Third, what enlightenment does understanding the relationship between tradition and modernity give us? First part. Let's answer the first question first. Why did Guizot re-understand the relationship between tradition and modernity in the context of the entire European history? As we mentioned above, Guizot lived in an era that can basically be said to be the post-revolutionary era. It was the continuous turmoil after the revolution that prompted Guizot to want to study this issue. Generally speaking, revolution is considered to be the most thorough means to overthrow the old things and shatter the old world, and it represents an undeniable negation of the old order. In 1789, the brave people of Paris stormed the Bastille and hoisted the tricolor flag symbolizing liberty, equality, fraternity, which is what we usually imagine of the French Revolution. However, the real French Revolution was far more complicated than this. In 1793, Four years after the storming of the Bastille, the French Revolution entered the Jacobin dictatorship phase. In just one year of the Jacobin dictatorship, the ideals of liberty and fraternity were replaced by factional struggles and killings, and countless heads fell and blood flowed like rivers. Stranger still, the French Revolution that followed the Jacobins seemed to open a devil's floodgate, and social unrest became the norm in France for nearly a century. Autocratic monarchy, constitutional monarchy, republic, revolutionary dictatorship, monarchy and other regimes have emerged in France in turn, and the society has been oscillating between autocracy and turmoil for a long time. It was not until the 1870s that France established a relatively stable liberal and democratic republic. In 1828, the year Guizot wrote this book, nearly 40 years have passed since the outbreak of the French Revolution. The Bourbon dynasty has been restored and a constitutional monarchy symbolizing the reconciliation of old and new France has been established. Guizot originally had hoped for this dynasty, and he expected to use a moderate constitutional monarchy to promote the political reform of France step by step. The Bourbon dynasty also made reform efforts for a time, but it didn't take long for it to become rigid and conservative again. France is once again confronted with a binary confrontation between radical revolutionaries and ultra-conservatives, facing the danger of unrest. In this cycle, the French revolutionaries played the role of removing the old and innovating, and wanted to break with the tradition completely. And the conservatives seem to be playing the role of reactionaries, wanting to regress everything to the feudal order of the Middle Ages. So in the final analysis, why did Guizot seek the connection between tradition and modernity? It was because of the era he lived in at that time, where tradition and modernity became incompatible concepts of rupture. Guizot disapproved of the idea of conservatives wanting to fall back on tradition. The study of the history of European civilization made him see that the outbreak of the French Revolution was not an accidental event, but a fruit of the long civilization process in Europe, especially in France. In the process of civilization for more than a dozen centuries, the powers of the nobility, the church, the royal power, and the citizens have risen one after another and occupied dominant positions one after another, but no one has the means to occupy an absolute dominant position. The struggle between them has promoted the continuous progress of European civilization. Guizot observed that since the 12th century, the power of the urban bourgeois engaged in industry and commerce has gradually grown, and the power of the feudal military aristocracy has gradually declined. After the rise of royal power, the traditional military aristocracy was further attacked. Over the centuries, the status of the nobility has been declining, the status of the bourgeoisie has been gradually rising, and the social structure has continued to change. Guizot believed that this long social revolution was the underlying reason for the outbreak of the political revolution of the French Revolution. Therefore, after the revolution, it is neither wise nor possible to return to the feudal order of the Middle Ages. If it is said that Guizot opposed the return to the old order and supported the French Revolution in principle, and regarded the revolution as the inevitable result of the progress of European civilization, then did he have no criticism of the revolution? It's not true. We know that the most radical revolutionaries in the French Revolution completely negated tradition with an unquestionable attitude. They attacked the church, uprooted the nobility and the royal power. But the problem encountered by the Great Revolution was that the old world was shattered, 
but the new order was not established. This realistic predicament forced Guizot to ask, are traditional and old things necessarily bad? Where is the relationship between tradition and modernity? As a society, how should we deal with this relationship? The second part. This involves the second question we want to answer, how to re-understand the relationship between tradition and modernity. Here we need to know that, as an outstanding historian, Guizot considered the relationship between tradition and modernity to be essentially a question of whether modern European civilization is unified with the past. If the two are unified, it means that tradition and modernity cannot be separated, and vice versa. Guizot affirmed the meaning of tradition very much, and he went back to European history and found a stable feature of European civilization throughout history, that is, pluralism. In the long course of history, this kind of diversity is reflected in the fact that European society has never produced an absolute dominant force. Powers such as the aristocracy, the kingship, and the church have been in a state of mutual checks and balances for a long time, and no one can occupy absolute rule. Status. And it is this diversity that gives the impetus to the continuous development of European civilization, and also provides a clear way of thinking for understanding the relationship between tradition and modernity. Guizot attached great importance to this difference, so starting from this standard, he traced the origin of modern European civilization to the 5th century AD, not ancient Greece or ancient Rome, but the moment when the Western Roman Empire fell. The reason is that in the 5th century AD, a decisive event happened in Europe. The Western Roman Empire, which had ruled Europe for hundreds of years, fell. Since then, Europe no longer has a single dominant force, but multiple forces exist simultaneously to check and balance each other. The embryo of modern European civilization was gradually conceived in these multiple forces. There are two specific manifestations. First, without the empire, the authority of the next level, such as the power of the king and the nobility, will rise. European royal power and aristocracy were born out of the barbarians during the Roman Empire, that is, the nomads and tribes living around the Roman Empire at that time. There is a widely spread view here, that is, compared with Rome, the civilization of the barbarians is relatively backward, so many people take it for granted that the destruction of Rome by the barbarians marks the arrival of a barbaric and backward Middle Ages. But Guizot didn't see it that way. Instead, he discovered the positive influence of the barbarians on European civilization. For example, the admiration of individual independence and freedom in modern civilization largely comes from the influence of barbarians. Because most of the barbarians live as nomads, they have the inherent bravery and unruliness of nomads, and they have a strong desire to pursue personal dignity, independence, and freedom. This spirit of freedom was deeply integrated into the blood of European civilization as the barbarians entered Europe. This is the first concrete manifestation of the multiple forces shaping European civilization. The second manifestation is that at the same time as the nobility and royal power rose, the Church absorbed the civilization achievements of the Western Roman Empire and became the most important spiritual power in the Middle Ages. Both before and during the French Revolution, the Church was constantly under attack by Enlightenmentists in France. When the Church is mentioned, some people may immediately think of closeness, ignorance, and even the stake for burning heretics. But Guizot found that in the field of culture, the church played an important role. The church is not the opposite of culture, but contributes to the development of European culture. For example, after the demise of the Western Roman Empire, along with military failures, the culture of ancient Rome also faced a crisis of eradication. So who preserved the ancient culture? Not the barbarians, but the church. The Church preserved a large number of ideological and cultural achievements of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and became the most important inheritor and developer of European spiritual civilization in the long Middle Ages. Therefore, we can't just see the Church burnt Bruno who advocated the heliocentric theory, but also see the great role played by the Church in inheriting culture. On the other hand, as a kind of spiritual power, the Church also plays an important role in improving the spiritual cultivation and moral sentiment of individuals. It can moderate the tendency of individual egoism, enhance social unity, and prevent individuals from indulging in material enjoyment and becoming a slave to money. So, at this point in this book, there are already two breakthrough insights. First, 
barbarians are not completely negative, second, the church has made a huge contribution to preserving culture. Both of these insights will greatly affect how we view European history and traditions. As views change, the relationship between tradition and reality will of course also change. Another point, although not as important as the above two points, is also worth mentioning, which is the role of cities in the Middle Ages. Around the 12th century, with the development of industry and commerce, the power of autonomous cities began to grow. Many cities obtained autonomy from feudal lords through money redemption or armed struggle. Citizens organized themselves to manage the public affairs of the city. Small republics were established, and the autonomy and public spirit unique to European civilization were gradually cultivated in this process. Combining the above three points, Guizot proposed that it was during this period in Europe that was belittled as the Dark Middle Ages that the modern civilization of Europe was born. Many not-so-famous forces, such as the church and barbarians mentioned above, Guizot is also trying to discover the value of them. The more value he unearths, the more he realizes that the history of European civilization is not a history of black and white struggles between angels and demons, science and the church, but the result of multiculturalism and the game of multiple factors. Therefore, when looking at tradition and history, we cannot use a simple one-size-fits-all perspective. However, it is true that for a certain period of time, Europe, and especially France, was under the influence of a single power, and this single power was the monarchy. The dominance of royal power is something that happened after the rise of the cities mentioned above. From the current point of view, you may think that royal power represents autocracy, but in medieval Europe where social power was dispersed and feudal lords were separated, royal power meant unity. Efficient central government, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries, under the protracted religious wars, the people could not bear the suffering of the wars, and they expected the kingship to become stronger and ensure the stability of the country. Therefore, the power of the king is indeed what everyone expects in this historical period. As a result, other social forces such as the nobles and the church were suppressed, and the society was indeed stable, but a crisis was secretly brewing. In 1789, the French people suddenly launched the French Revolution, which shocked the world and shattered their dream of a stable life with their own hands. And not only in France, but also in Britain, Germany and other countries, the revolution of royal power has become a trend. So how should this period of European civilization evolution history be explained? Guizot believes that people call for royal power to a certain extent, because the society needs a stable order, but if the royal power is overinflated and becomes an exclusive social force with absolute advantages, there will be hidden dangers. Therefore, Guizot believes that the rise of royal power has maintained order, but its development cannot exceed certain limits it still has to restrain itself in a multicultural framework. In this framework, any kind of power that is too strong will be not a good thing. Speaking of this, everyone must have understood that the French Revolution, whose life was revolutionized, and who was against it. Of course, the target of the revolution was the French royal family, and what it opposed was not the European tradition since ancient times. What it opposed was only the dominance of the royal family, which was only a part of the entire European history. There is one thing that Guizot doesn't know, but we all know that since the French Revolution, after so many years of development, equality for all has become a recognized common sense. Have reached maturity. During this period, Europe entered the framework of multiculturalism and the game of multiple factors that Guizot called. This also just shows in practice that Guizot's law of the development and evolution of European civilization is correct. The third part. This is Guizot's understanding of the relationship between tradition and modernity. The key word is three words, diversity. Now let's answer the third question, what enlightenment can Guizot's knowledge give us contemporary people? In fact, Guizot put so much effort into discussing this issue because he wanted to tell people that the new world you like and want did not fall from the sky, but from the 5th, 10th, and 15th centuries. Step by step, in the 18th century, it was born out of the old world. The new world is a product of the old world, and the connection between the old and the new should not and cannot be broken. Multiple forces such as the church, nobility, and royal power struggle with each other and coexist with each other. This is not a chaotic hodgepodge. On the contrary, 
it is this traditional diversity that prevents European society from becoming rigid and stagnant, and European civilization can always maintain its vitality. A society where new and old things are reconciled and where diversity coexists is freer and more prosperous than a society where a single social force dominates. A mature and healthy society should not reject change, let alone tradition. At this point we can answer more specifically, what did the French discover when they rediscovered Guizot more than a hundred years after the publication of this book? In fact, they discovered a model of an ideal society that conforms to the laws of European development. This society must first ensure order and not be turbulent. Guizot affirmed the kingship not because he liked the ruling classes at the time, but because the kingship could ensure order and stability and stop wars. This is one of the prerequisites. Second, ensure diversity. Similarly, if the royal power that guarantees order and stability is too strong and breaks the pluralistic pattern, it will become a factor that leads to instability. After 1985, contemporary French academics advocated Guizot precisely because they worried that the public would become this dominant factor in the history after 1968. If democracy abandons the government, abandons the representative system, and goes directly to populism, it will lead to social instability, tyranny, and ultimately the opposite of democracy. Now let's summarize the enlightenment brought to us by Guizot's history of European civilization. First of all, we should not blindly favor the present and underestimate the past. Guizot's history of European civilization reveals the continuity between the Ancien Regime and the Great Revolution, tradition and modernity. He told people that the modern European society was born in the Middle Ages. Nobility, the church, and royal power, these social forces that were considered outdated by Europeans in the 19th century, all contributed to the progress of European civilization. Therefore, there is a need to maintain a tender respect for history and tradition. In addition, more importantly, the dominance of any single social force may suffocate freedom and lead to social stagnation. Therefore, in order to maintain the vitality of society, we must not blindly pursue innovation, but must allow new and old things to reconcile and coexist in diversity. A pluralistic society can truly guarantee the vitality of a society and ensure that the society always moves forward. This is of great significance for us to better understand our society and rationally view social changes. This is the end of this episode of the show. What do you think about it differently? Welcome to leave a message to discuss with everyone. Hey, if you like our channel, please subscribe us. Haha, <laughs> remember to like it.